Hi everyone, I'm Bruno Aziz and welcome to another episode of Data Journeys. This is the place that we come to to learn from data analytics leaders, their success, their do's and don'ts. And today we're going to talk to Nir from Search Kings. He's going to tell us why they are the data kings. Nir, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Let's get started. What is Search Kings? So Search Kings is a digital advertising agency. We're based out of uh, Toronto in, in Canada, 85 employees. Uh, we're in the business of building and managing digital campaign for our customers. Most of them are in home services and professional services. Uh, we have around 5,000 customers uh, and we manage around half million dollar a day of spend. So the demand generation marketing, this is bound to bring a lot of data together. So tell us a little bit about the use cases that you're deploying today and, and how data preparation is becoming a part of uh, your work on a daily basis. So our core product is lead generation, but basically means attribution. So we search kings and we're the data kings, if you want to, uh, to call it. Our customers expect return. Uh, every conversation starts with number and ends with number. So we have to measure quite a bit. Over the past, uh, let's say, six to 12 months, we, we start getting involved more and more with data, actually with the acceleration of machine learning and automation. We, we found ourselves in a place where we need to not only understand the data, but to make sure the machines are doing what they're supposed to do. And one of the best way to do it is to provide your own set of KPI to your customers uh, that verify that the goals they would like to achieve really being uh, achieved or an expectation of being met. And we did it with data preparation because we found that we have uh, lots of platforms we work with and we have our own proprietary platform. We look for a way to bring it all together and provide a unified view for our customers. And data preparation was the way to do so. So, and you're also working with a lot of scale, 2 million jobs daily, 75 Google functions right. that handle replication in real time. Right. So tell me a little bit about, you know, how the whole journey started. What drove you to make the decision to use the platforms that you're using today? So we are a Google premium partner on the advertising side and on the technology side, we use obviously Google cloud technology and we built our own proprietary platform since uh, I would say 2010 when we started thinking about that. And it started in a very, very basic idea of looking around Google Cloud and try to find a solution to a problem that we, we came across, which was really lots of raw material data sitting in one side and the need to bring it in our case to data studio on the other side. And the fact we have our own platform, we, we looked at uh, data studio to start, but obviously Trifacta and data preparation as, as the tool we're using in a way to bring it and enhance our, our platform. As you mentioned, we are running uh, over 2 million jobs daily. A typical customer of, uh, of Search King will spend anywhere between, let's say, 50 to, to $200 a day. And, and those data points will include their lead to generate, the impression share, and lots of other uh, digital indicators that we manage right now in consolidated view and run different flows that together create uh, views for our customers on Data Studio, both customers and channels. So channels will be set of customers who work together and, and benefit from our solution on the data side. And what kind of data are you bringing? Where does the data originate from? Right. What, what does the pipeline look like? Yes, so that's where it became very interesting for us. So we have the traditional way of, of counting leads and, and leads will be phone calls or, or text or, or web forms. But then over time we realized that we're actually able to start looking at what we call trust signals on our side. And trust signals are, are indicators that comes from the platform that allow us to make sure that what we're working on and what we're trying to achieve is really progressing the right, the right way. And, and the new area that literally in the last few months we have been working on is to try and provide trust signals to our customers from the market. So a good idea will be, can we take Google reviews, which is a very important indicator in digital advertising and analyze and benchmark it for our customers so they understand how they can develop trust signals with their customers. In this case, is homeowners. We're mainly in a B2C environment. So trust signal is uh, the result of you bringing data together, running a model on top of it, so you can kind of assess right. the value, the credibility of, of data. I mean, how did you come up with this algorithm in the first place? So trust signals, you know, let, let's, let's break it down and just actually talk about a very, very simple example. When you are a homeowner and actually you're buying product from, from uh, a contractor. So a trust signal, the way I define it is what is the probability that my future experience will be positive and reflect the past experience with specific, uh, with specific provider. Now let's take it to the data side. Can I look at set of data, use different trust signals that verify that the information 
that I see on my side really indicate future trends. And I think what we find that the technology is definitely not the barrier anymore. Even implementation has become very easy. What we find is a gap that we worked really hard on is how do you work with customer or a user, which is not only super sophisticated and provide them with two of the three indicators, we call them the trust signals, that give them the two or three pieces of information which are very relevant to them. So a flow that may, may include 50 or 60 data points may end up being only two or three specific areas that we focus on for each customer. So this is interesting. This is removing basically the noise and getting to the signals because marketing yeah. departments tend to measure a lot of things. But you seem to have figured out, okay, what are the key metrics that truly move the needle? So I think uh, for friends, I usually say what Search King does, I say we're leaving the gap between what technology can do and what users can understand. And if, if you talk about where the world is going and where how we fit in, data prep was one tool to help us mine this gap. We feel very, very confident the human interaction with, with data is going to accelerate. Uh, while well, automation is going to accelerate at the same time. So the gap between what technology can do and what users can understand and use is probably widen and not actually become any smaller. And, and data prep is a great way to mine this gap. That is a great sum, but I'm sure it thinks that the audience here will relate to a lot of technology, a lot of data, and then there's what we can actually understand and act upon. Now, you've been in this space for a long time, and so I want to kind of take from you what you've learned. You know, if you were to talk to yourself at the beginning of this journey, what would be the things you would do? What would be the things right. that you would avoid? Let's start with the positive. What would be the one piece of advice you'd give everyone listening they must absolutely do in order to be successful with data? I would say that your super user or, or the project leader, and I'm focused less about the title, but more about the person who leading it, should have very, very good understanding of the business. I think that today it makes much more sense to take a user who knows very little about data, but know very a lot about your business and introduce them to the concept of using data at scale. So if I could choose one thing, I would definitely have the project leader to come from the business side and not necessarily from the data side. I think this is the, the number one. The number two, uh, I would say, you should probably say yes to every opportunity for the first three months when someone say, can we do that? So I believe the default answer should be yes. You may want to, <laughs> Look at it again after 90 days to see, do you really add value? But there is no better way to learn about new technology other than actually trying and, and trying at scale. Wait, so yes to everything. That sounds kind of scary, but, but tell me more about that. Why is that? Is it because you uh, imagine that you just right. don't know what you don't know or what's the idea? Behind yeah, that? so I believe most of, of the audience today understand the concept of MVP, the minimum viable product. So we were all familiar with that. I would actually take it one step even, even further and say, well, you're trying new stuff. You, you have to understand that you're building skill internally. And, and sometimes the problem itself may not justify the investment in the long run, but in the short term is a great opportunity to learn new skill. Uh, we love the night that at 4 or 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, we, we figure out we're completely stuck and wake up at 7 a.m. with a new solution. So getting stuck is also a very, very important part of the process. I believe manuals are, are fine and, and webinars are okay, but there is no better way other than facing, facing an, a challenge that you have to go and do it in a different way. And Trifacta, as a partner, had an unbelievable community together with Google Cloud it's less about solving the problem for us, but introducing us to, to, to someone who faced similar problem. And I think you only hit those problems when you are trying new things and, and you are trying to dare uh, more and more when it comes to data. Yeah, I can't remember who said uh, if you're not failing, you're, you're, you're doing something wrong, right? So that's the idea is just uh, develop skill and, and keep on trying. I want to go back to this idea of connectors because I think at your company, you, you recruited what you called ambassadors right. for data prep. What, what is that? Where did they come from? And yeah. Then, what's the profile of an ambassador? So we are a young company, by the way, you're you are talking right now to the oldest person of 85 people at Search Kings. <laughs> so our... our uh, employee-based uh, young individuals, and they like to try new new things. We found very quickly that working with a set of five or eight individuals with their customers directly and empower them to, I use even the term to celebrate data. So celebrate data means to take the power of data and, and bring it to a level that 
it doesn't only add value, it differentiates uh, your company and, and take the conversation to a completely different path. So ambassadors, their, their job is not only to accept what you suggest, which is sometimes or accelerate the message. Their job is also to lead you and, and push you in direction that you didn't think originally. I think when we talk about the word ambassador and change management, we always say we need this core group is going to accept the strategy and run with it. I would say in our case, the ambassador are those who actually point us in the right direction and say, I have a need here that maybe you can solve for me. Usually those needs started very basically. Here is where Google Analytics doesn't give us the information with Google Ads and we have a Microsoft advertising, how we do it together. But sometimes it, it went completely differently to add the data feed of a third party or something we never thought about before. How weather impact lead generation in the HVAC industry is a very, very common example. We did quite a bit of work with that as well. What's the profile of an ambassador? You know, how many years in college? What type of field? Yeah. What type, you know, where they come from? Yeah. So those ambassadors are Search Kings employees, right? So they are uh, staff members. What's really interesting to at least to take into consideration, and, and I think you want to think about it internally when you select those ambassadors. Sometimes the U.S. members on your team are the best ambassadors. So you always try to balance between, okay, do do I Put on my team the, the individual is here four or five years and when he says something everyone listens or you're actually trying to engage those who just joined and there's something beautiful about them they don't know much about the business yet and, and maybe they look at this new tool is about new way of doing things for you but for them it will be the only way for you for doing new things so i would say the idea around ambassadors should be the, the most important part they should be individual who have very strong communication skill a, explain what it would like to see, and more importantly, to go after the fact and share with us how it can be used at scale. That's great. So we learned a lot about data ambassadors. Now let's flip to the other side, the negative stuff, the stuff you want to avoid. Yeah. Uh, what would you say would be the one or two things that, you know, maybe you wish you'd avoided or you know is a best practice to not right. be distracted by? I think that it's okay to try different things and it's okay to make mistakes. I think when you work with data, you must maintain the data integrity at all time. So, so I think one thing you want to be very, very careful early in the process, you don't want to start producing different solutions that the end user question the data integrity because to go back to the end user and say, we're still working on that, it will get accurate. You are going to pay price, price in the long run. So I think it's okay to to slow down production as long as you keep the data integrity in place. The other thing, and I would, you know, on the Google Cloud side, I would bring and think about cost from the very beginning. So when you build infrastructure, I don't think you have to worry about the dollar and cent it's going to cost you to, to run different flows. And by the way, it's going to cost a little bit more than dollar and cents. It can get pricey very quickly. But I would say that when you build a new system, ask yourself, what happened if we become 10x or 100x? Is that something that we have the appetite to work with in the long run? Or I'm building something right now, which is truly valid only for the pilot phase and it will be challenged later. So those are the two points, cost from the beginning and data integrity. How do you guarantee data integrity? Are there particular things that you've done either by using the tool or through processes you implemented that make sure you're staying on top of right. this data integrated problem because it is a huge issue, right? Garbage in, garbage out. There are two things we, we've done. Number one, we try not to integrate and connect all the systems right away. So we try to run with parallel system and, and it allows you a very, very simple, easy to use benchmark that you can look at data from one side and the other and said, okay, th does that make sense? That do you, what the trends you see here is, is something that you, you feel comfortable with knowing that those are not integrated. I think you get a little bit into trouble when you try to integrate too much too fast right away. Number two, I think this is where experience can help. Uh, and when you combine someone very new with someone very experienced in one team and you let them put together, sometimes it's okay to ask, does that make sense to you? And we're not arguing right now if what we see on the screen is actually what we found through, through our process. But if we didn't have all this great technology and we have a piece of paper and wrote it down, does that make sense for uh, to you? And, and we... In a few cases, we, we found some major error at the very, very beginning just by, by leaving the computer and have a, a whiteboard discussion where we look at the data and say, does that make sense? We, we know we manage around half a million dollar a day of spend at Search King. So we have good understanding of, of the business before we start using the advanced tools. And we try not to, to lose this perspective once we engage with those advanced tools.
Got you. Okay, so this is super helpful on how to maintain data in integrity. Part of it is process. Part of it is actually the speed at which you're mm -hmm. integrating all that data. Now, I didn't prepare you for this question, but I always ask it. What is your favorite trifecta or Google data prep feature? We're big fans of Trifecta. We were introduced to Trifecta through Google Cloud. So we founded the solution on, on Google Cloud and, and we watched a few videos and said it looks really cool. I think the the UX or, or the user interface, sorry, of, of being able to visualize a flow and realize that you can visually understand how the data moves, in our case, from bucket to bucket. And the idea that you can look at a recipe and I think the language around recipe introduced a new concept at Search King that we're really looking at that. We have raw material, we brought it to the kitchen, and now we're going to cook something. So I think the language that sounds probably very normal for data prep, we were introduced to this language. And this language create almost like a shift in our culture, how we look at data in general. So we, we look at raw material, and then we're going and have a recipe in place. And at the end, it has to be uh, it's like every other meal. Uh, for meal to be successful, it has to be enjoyable. That's excellent. Well, we have learned a lot from you today, the concept of the data ambassador, how to maintain integrity. I hope people are going to reach out to you and, of course, ask your questions and connect with you as part of an exceptional member of the community. Nir, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. If you want to find out more from stories just like this one, make sure to click on the link down below. Until next time, I'm Bruno Aziza.